and that connection has been uninterrupted. Uh, the reason that I make the point of saying unceded lands, of course, there have been layers of interpretation that have been placed on these lands since colonization began here in the 1800s. And even as recently as the beginning of this year in uh, measures that have seen the Bunwarang people t momentarily sidelined. Nevertheless, this land of the Bunwarang people has had a song line, a body of knowledge, in other words, poured into it, enacted out upon it for millennia. And as a creative person, and these days, as I would say, I'm almost willing to say this, principally as a composer, haven't quite given up my status as a soprano, <laughs> but as principally a composer these days, I am the beneficiary of the knowledge and the wisdom that is the lived understanding that has been poured into these lands through cultural practice. A practice that is older here than anywhere else in the world. And that's cause for celebration. On a day, and I might say to everyone who is perhaps joining us from outside of Victoria, there is little to be celebrated. But if we can reach back past our current circumstances, if we can reach back prior to Federation, if we can reach back prior to the beginning of colonization on this continent, and we can connect to the body of knowledge that has been passed on through the arts for millennia on this continent, we can see a way forward, perhaps, to becoming not only the enablers, but being able to discern who it is we wish to enable and who it is we would well do without enabling. <laughs> I want to talk to you today about my own journey and some of the challenges that I face as a composer who has almost entirely dedicated uh, her career to the amplification of First Nations stories and cultural identity. I face a dilemma and I'm going to talk about that, but I thought I'd give you an excerpt from a recent work of mine. Boy, I've been saying recent for a couple of years now. This is from the 2019 premiere of my work Umarella, A War Requiem for Peace. Let's see if we can get this to work the way we want it to. Eh? We did rehearse, like any good musician. Let's see if this works for you. Benjamin Northey there, in front of the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra with Melbourne Symphony, uh, with Melbourne Symphony Orchestra Chorus, Consort of Melbourne, Dungala Children's Choir, and the soloist Linda Barkin Mezzo, Don Bemrose, uh, Don Christopher, rather, he's married now, Don Christopher, baritone, and myself, soprano. Thank you. 
There we go. I'll just uh, I'll just mute. I'll just do a little fade there. Don't like just cut it off mid sentence. It's a little excerpt from the work Eumorella, a War Requiem for Peace. And I've got Judith Foster on my screen and she will testify to the fact that even recently there have been through um, uh, the Australian Music Centre requests for the score of Eumorella. And indeed, Judith, I re receive regular requests via the website of Short Black Opera, my company. And as librarians all, and as lovers of music, I'm taking that for granted. I'm assuming that's a given. Uh, and you understand, and as one of your objectives is to assist composers to, to derive a living from, from, their, from their written works and uh, published and unpublished even works, you would be wondering what my hesitancy might be, if you've detected it by now, around the sharing of the score of Eumorella. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't know much about Eumorella, I'll give you a little uh, a nutshell. Um, it's a work, I think, which marks a huge turning point for me as a composer. It was the first time that I had written a work of this scale for orchestral forces and entirely orchestrated it myself. As I mentioned before, I, for most of my career, has view, have viewed myself as a soprano. And to that end, the cultural identity that I carry is, well, it's simply put, it's simply not what I, just what I do, it's who I am. But at this point in my career as a composer with a number of works under my belt, Eumorella, or this opportunity to write for the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, the symphonic version of Eumorella came along and uh, it marked a great turning point. But as a work, it is, in every sense of the word, a landmark piece. It's entirely sung in the language of the Gunditjmara people. Now, if you're wondering where Gunditjmara country is, perhaps some of you live on Gunditjmara country. Certainly if you live anywhere between Colac in southwestern Victoria, uh, down to and across the sort of imaginary border uh, with South Australia, then you'd be living on Gunditjmara country, one of the clans of the Gunditjmara. It's where colonisation began in Victoria. And the stories that the Gunditjmara have to tell are, well, since colonisation began, stories of brutality, of dispossession, of regaining of country and of ultimate success in native, both native title and world heritage listing. But the early shared history of the Gunditjmara and the colonisers is a brutal one, one that... Uh, is something that I'd like you to read about. Uh, well, I'm talking to the, I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, but this is a history that you can look into. A Eumorella, a War Requiem for Peace was a commission, well, of sorts, it was a request from senior leadership of Gunditjmara to write a work that would commemorate the 23 years of brutal conflict known as the Eumorella Wars that took place on Gunditjmara country, much of it alongside the Eumorella itself, which of course is a river that flows through much of Gunditjmara country. Gunditjmara country in terms of size, if you, if you had to equate it to another country, it's the size of Cyprus, for instance. So we're talking about vast tracts of country here. The Gunditjmara people estimated at roughly 9,000 pre-colonisation, although that number could be much greater, but at the very least 9,000 people at the end of that 23 years of conflict reduced to just 77. We were rounded up and put onto Lake Condar Mission. It was at Lake Condar Mission after I'd had a, a terrifying experience of realizing how, uh, of realizing how distressed and disturbed the land still is 
from the brutality of early colonization, standing there, looking out to a line of trees that seemed to be shouting at me the anguish of those early years. It was at that point that senior Gunditjmara elder Ken Saunders asked me, could I write a work? Could I write a work that would capture that story? In fact, he had asked me originally, would I write an opera? He'd seen or he saw shortly after the request to write some sort of work. He came to see my opera, Pecan Summer. I think uh, the library at uh, Victorian College of the Arts, uh, when Georgina was uh, at the helm, was the very first library to own a copy of Pecan Summer. Pecan Summer had uh, a season in Adelaide and Uncle Ken Saunders travelled from Gunditjmara country down to Garner country, saw Pecan Summer and asked me, would I write an opera? But at the time I realised that an opera just wouldn't be enough. An opera would put up a fourth wall. An opera would create not enough opportunity for those people who need to not only know about this history, but also understand it. It would not create a great enough opportunity. And so I chose the format of the War Requiem. There's a fair bit of um, agency that I gave, license that I gave myself and uh, knowing that Benjamin Britten had departed from the, the Requiem proper, uh, the Latin texts, and of course so effectively used the poetry of Wilfred Owen. And I felt that I, I too could take the scaffolding or the structure of the Requiem and write a work that could then be translated into Gunditjmara, and it was, it was translated by senior Gunditjmara language custodian Vicky Cousins and linguist Travis Ira. And this work is 85 minutes of Gunditjmara language. In fact, the first time it was performed, it was down on country in Port Ferry, the Spring Festival. Perhaps some of you were there. If you were, I hope you've recovered. It was the hottest day I've ever experienced performing in a basketball court at 43 degrees in a velvet gown. Um, not a wise choice for that day. But there I was, and it brings me to my dilemma and the, the, the meat of this subject today. This cultural knowledge of the Gunditjmara people, this story that was entrusted to me as a Yorta Yorta woman, is now a score and several orchestras have played it and one orchestra has tried to play it twice now Umarel has been postponed in WA now twice. So if you live in WA or you're planning on going there, the first moment you can get out of Victoria or New South Wales next year, Umarela in Perth. Third time's a charm, they say. Now this story, this history, the cultural knowledge embedded into Umarela, the language itself, an endangered language on the brink of being extinguished, revived in part by the translation of the text of Umarella. This is not simply a score to read and play. I've been quite torn in my response to the many lecturers from the various universities around Australia and one international university as well who've written me, to me, usually after the fact, to tell me that Umarella has been included in their course and they've been teaching to Umarella for some time now. And uh, look, it'd be great to get an official score. <laughs> All of these things. You can imagine. Of course, I'm thrilled that people are, are, are taking notice of this story. That was the whole point of the work. But also there's the dilemma. There's a deep body of knowledge embedded in this work. One that I had to acquire myself as a Yorta Yorta woman, particularly as a, stol a member of the Stolen Generations, with so much of my own cultural ed education coming so late in my life over the last 20, 30 years of my life. Here I am entrusted with this sacred story, this most powerful vehicle for 
not only knowledge but the greater journey understanding and an audience who who love access to this music this the printed form of of the score and yet how can i guarantee the necessary understanding you know i was recently offered a gig and i think that that's a wonderful thing in 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 these pandemic times to be offered a gig and this gig gosh it would have been quite a lucrative one i'd say probably something that would stretch a, a project that would stretch out, out over the next 10 years but it came with a dilemma the gig was for me to create and curate some music that would accompany some images by well-known First Nations artists, painted, sculptural. But the demands were such that I was to create and curate the music before I ever saw the paintings or the sculptures. There's a saying we have in my company, Short Black Opera, that a song is not just a song. And a painting is not just a painting. And this requiem is not just a requiem. It is a body of knowledge. And Australia stands on the brink of something truly wonderful or falling back into an abyss that we know only too well. Let's take the truly wonderful and maybe we can avoid the abyss altogether. The truly wonderful point at which we can, as a society, realize that we're the continuation of something. Something for musicians and artists that has taken place on these lands that we gather together on longer here than anywhere else. That we can be part of the continuation. How wonderful is that? But we can't merely just pick up the score of you, Morella, and say that we understand by what I've written on the page. No composer could do that. Because within those pages are the lived experience of the Gunditjmara people and their histories are still only just being known and for most people only just being understood. So when Judith writes to me and I evasively say, oh, Judith, can you put that person in touch with me, that person who wants to buy the score of you, Morella? What I'm really saying is I'm going to put aside time that I don't necessarily have, but I'm committed to putting aside the time, devoting the time, if you like, to that person and their desire to understand something. Something that Australians... There's been, well, a, a deliberate, a deliberate attempt, and successful in many cases, a deliberate action to keep us from the knowledge that we really need to understand our own belonging on this continent. I think the pandemic has brought this all into sharp focus. Well, it certainly has for me. The divisions, the fault lines. Ah, but back to the dilemma. What do I do as a composer of other people's knowledge when people want to teach their university course about Umarella? I'm also always so um, curious as to know, well, what are they saying? Simply what they see on the page? That's just a beginning. That's like a kind of act of compliance because if I want a, an orchestra of 110 people to play it and 120 people to sing it, then I need to comply with the conventions of how that performance might come about in an orderly fashion. But compliance can never be a destination. At best, compliance is, is a departure point. Well, I haven't, I haven't resolved the dilemma of what to do about 
Umarala, except to say perhaps that if you're interested in having it in your library, then perhaps it needs to come with a little package of resources. Read Convincing Ground. Watch the numerous uh, conversations that I've had with people that are available on YouTube. Invite me to come and speak to your orchestra or to your, uh, to your lecture theatre. I'm not promising I'll always be available, but there need to be resources around it because we're in danger of making the same mistake just over and over and over again that the early colonizers made. And that was nothing of value here nothing to be known that we don't already know or that we can't just find out separate from the people separate from their lived knowledge in other words separate from their wisdom of course we can't do that we've tried that for 230 something years it's not working and where it is getting better that's opening up those fault lines even further with with those political masters, for instance, who who don't see the need to truly recognise. What's required is truth-telling. How can a score come with so much? <laughs> Not baggage. So many resources, really. So many opportunities to know. That's why I wrote Humorella, A War Agreement for Peace, so that people could know and I wrote it for a huge choir so that the maximum number of people could benefit from the knowing and the journey into understanding. That was very deliberate. Choirs are something of um, a kind of network, a kind of a network of veins that flow through society and keep things bubbling along. I, I truly believe that about choirs. And if you can win over a choir then you have done a lot of good because those people don't live in isolation. <laughs> well, actually we do, we all live in isolation. Fancy saying that in these times. But in normal times, those choristers go home and they're changed by their experience. One of the things I've missed most, and this is going to sound like I'm, I'm I'm just currying favour here, but it's absolutely true. One of the things I missed most very early on was the opportunity to walk into a library and sit down with the pages of other scores. And so I understand what it is, somebody who has a great interest in Umarella wanting to sit down with that score. But what they must understand, beyond the music that I write and the idioms and the various musicologists will analyse, that I suppose when they can get their hands on it. What they must understand is that this comes from a lived experience that unless Australians more generally can understand that lived experience, can understand our part in it, can accept and acknowledge our shared history, then we can't go forward and no single performance will get us there, no pages of a score will get us there. The relationship with First Nations Australia will get us there. And that's where it's very personal. I think a few people have asked me to write <laughs> an autobiography. My God, that would be condemning myself, really. But if I ever did, and I've considered what the title would be, it would be, you had to be there. And that's what I felt when everything locked up, when the library at Monash, when we were limited access and then no access for a time, I just felt so disconnected. I wanted to be there. I had to be there. Online just wasn't going to be enough. Well, with a score like you, Morala, and the numerous other ones, I've run out of time to talk about Woven Song today, but Woven Song is another example of a collection of works that is based on cultures from other places than my own outside of Yorta Yorta culture. It's not my place just to pass that on, not without a great duty of care to inform. I feel um, that I'm either getting a, a wave, a friendly wave 
from Georgina or please stop now because you've said everything we want to hear or five, five minutes. minutes. Five That's minutes. five minutes. You know, Georgina, I should have told you I have terrible, <laughs> terrible reputation at reading the signs. You know, when I, I, I'll often have my, my beautiful partner, Tony, my partner in music and life, she'll be in the audience and I'll say, give me a sign when it's five minutes, will you, darling? I remember this one, um, one, one speech I was giving once, one keynote and and, and Tony had been sort of sitting there like this. And I thought, why is she touching herself? You know, she was basically going, stop, stop. And I didn't know. Anyway, thanks, Georgina. Uh, you know, the woven song pieces, here's a very good example. Um, you know, and one of the, two of them actually have been, have derived their text from um, the Pinterby translation of the uh, Declaration of Human Rights. Um, you know, I'm I'm responding to tapestries that have been created at the Australian Tapestry Workshop, and they have been inspired by artworks that have been painted by some of the greatest First Nation artists in this country, and um, those stories, those those tapestries, those tapestries come with a story in embedded in them. In fact, with a song embedded in them, and. Um, to simply just share that without all of the knowledge that's embedded in there. It's, it's just not the right way to go about culture. Um, and so the end of that other story I was telling you about that lucrative 10 year opportunity to curate and compose for paintings that I hadn't seen yet. I had to say no, I can't do that. Because those paintings that will be part of that event, they come with their own song. I'm going to juxtapose something on top of them without knowing. It's not necessary to do that. You can think your way through to doing something differently. You can have a body of knowledge that's embedded in the pages of a score as long as it's surrounded with all of the deep understanding that has enabled that score to exist. It might slow down the success, I suppose, of my career as a published composer. I don't really mind. Uh, I think that I, the wonderful opportunities I've been given by all of those orchestras and ensembles that Georgina mentioned very kindly in the introduction uh, and next year, Bapa Ripna. Uh, we'll be there with Jaime Martin and um, William Barton. It's the first time I'll write for Yadaki. Interesting process for me because, of course, women are not permitted or or uh, are best not to play the Yadaki. Uh, and um, so usually I'd have a crack at any instrument that I was writing for. But uh, next year in February, there you have it, a col collaboration with William Barton that brings him in front of the MSO, something to look forward to. But he'll bring his knowledge as a Kalkadun man and I'll bring my knowledge as a Yoda Yoda woman and and hopefully there'll be conversations so that the audience can feel that they've not just heard something, that they've understood it. Thank you, Deborah, so much. Um, what a wonderfully powerful expression of your creative process um, and reflection, um, especially with your Morella. Unfortunately, I um, wasn't at the performance in Port Ferry or Melbourne, but maybe I will get to Perth. Maybe that's a good excuse to go. Um, actually, I think Cassandra, one of our colleagues from WA has actually put the link and the dates into the chat. So everyone take note, especially those on the it's East. <laughs> it's the link in the dates for next. Hopefully, it's the link in the dates for next year. Yes, um, it is. Yeah. Great. Thank yep. you so much. I we, think, as uh, I say, we've tried. <laughs> yes, yeah, 30th of thirtieth of September, twenty twenty two. Maybe the borders will be open by then. Um, now, have we any questions um, in the chat? Um, I'm just looking. Um, perhaps I'll start off. Um, I, I think your comment, um, particularly about um, the teaching of your works, because everyone 
will want to now and into the future, Deborah, because of the, the amazing works that you're doing in um, sharing the language and, and also that, that um, embodied process um, of place that are in your works. Um, I'm just, it's going to be an interesting time ahead for, especially for um, musicologists and music teachers, whether they're in primary school, secondary school, tertiary level even. Um, and how it's also part of um, it's, um, making them aware of the need to be able to engage with the, the kind of, the, as you say, the package around that, the package of resources around it and for them to know. I mean, have you any ideas how, how you would like it to be? Um, because your, your, your time is precious too, isn't it? Um, apart from making a video of yourself um, and the conversation. I well, I think for people who are interested in uh, in Umarella in particular, but there are lots of other examples, and I've spoken about my own experience today. Um, but I think for those people who are interested in Umarella, there are there are in conversation with uh, resources on on the MSO website. A really really good one between Benjamin Northey, Vicky Cousins, and myself, uh, and that I think. <sighs> Look, it goes to a much deeper question of what art and culture is in our society. It, it's not simply something you do. It's something that sustains and enables you to be. Uh, it was, is a way of knowing and being in the world. And so that's not our, how our big or even small organizations run they need repertoire they chew through it very quickly <laughs> although mso chorus almost came a cropper on this one they thought that um <laughs> i don't think they mind me sharing this because really they came to the party in the end and they they did a great job but when they first picked up their casually picked up their scores to do one of their two rehearsals ahead of the re <laughs> of the performance this is what I mean. Um, they they reassured me that they'd be fine singing 80 minutes of Gunda Chamara because they'd recently sung in Mandarin. And I just at that point realised, um, well, at least that particular alto, I'm saying it was an alto because I'm a soprano, but anyway, it could have been a soprano. That particular chorister obviously just didn't understand because our music practice today is not what it needs to be for our health and in fact i'll be on the drum tonight if anybody wants to tune in they've lured me on with the promise that i can talk about the healing power of music but i've seen the other journos that, that are on there so it's probably going to be some sort of i don't know there'll be some crossfire i suppose but i will talk about the power of music to heal but i also talk about its place and its actual purpose and it's so much more than something we do in our spare time. It is our way of knowing ourselves at the most, at the highest level. And it has not been celebrated that way here since colonization began for, for non-indigenous people, but and for indigenous people, even now it's very, it's very hard because music in our curriculums, in our primary and secondary schools is in a parallel, um, parlor state. It really is. And, uh, so I think we all we can do is put some resources around it and and I need to carve out some time ahead of um, next year's uh, WA performance and subsequent ones in the years following, which I can't announce yet, but there will be more, so that you can have a package of resources around it. If people want to know about it, then they need to at least uh, embed that knowledge in their thinking. And, and I would say... What on earth are you telling this story for if you've never been to that country? And, and even if you've been to that country, you know, as a composer, I, look, I before the bad old days began, I would go to I would go to Italy, I would go to Venice just about every year, I'd go to Paris every year. Does that make me equipped to start suddenly writing only in French and telling the story of that country? No, <laughs> just because I've been there. And I can order a bagel in French. It doesn't, you know, or a baguette. It doesn't mean that I should be writing that culture. So, yeah, I, I think it's the deeper question, Georgina, and I've left no time for other people's questions, but the deeper it's, question. No, that's okay. We've got some, there's, um, there's two questions I can oh, see. Good. Meredith, I think you'd like to say something. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. That was amazing. I, I don't know if I've quite got this in words clearly, but I'll, I'll give it a go. I, I found it was interesting, um, you know, talking about the score as an artifact and how that's just really not very, uh, it doesn't give you a good idea of the work. Um, and then if we are making records of an artifact as librarians when we're cataloging it, is there something we can be doing in the way that we describe uh, a score that shifts the focus of how people access a work? That's interesting, Meredith. Thank you for the question and, and thank you for that word. I That's a really elevated word and also, uh, yeah, that's an interesting word, artifact. I think um, the score itself, yes, it's a piece of music. Um, what is, in terms of the, if, if there is a status of artifact about it, it's about the language uh, mostly. And when, when I can get around to it, because it isn't just somebody something I can send off to a copyist or stand, send off to a publishing house, but there, there are 19 bespoke works, works of art that I commissioned to go with each of the movements that were painted by uh, Gunditjmara artist Tom Day. And um, those, um, those works need to be published with, uh, with, with the score so that the whole thing can be understood. And so, um, you know, it's, 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 it's really a case where I'm almost saying to myself, I'll get on with it, Deborah, and make sure um, everybody can have this. I'll just show an example of one of those paintings, if I may, share my screen one more time. Um, yeah, but uh, it's, it's not um, artifact. Yeah, gosh, that's a really interesting word. Mm. I, I'm, I, I, can't make that happen so I'm not going to stress myself about it but suffice to say there are 19 large-scale works that were painted that go with that are projected while the performance happens and in essence you actually need to have those as well and then you need to have the description so it comes layered with all this cultural meaning and to just have the notes which is what exists at the moment um, isn't enough but what you can do I think uh, is is allow yourself the time to um, uh, to to invite perhaps Vicky Cousins to come and speak about or or come and meet with Vicky rather uh, myself Tom Day also um, and and acquaint yourself with the lived experience that are in these pages um, you see. A lot of people can 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 say that my score also has that significance. There'll be a lot of music that comes out of this pandemic, for instance, of lived experience. But the accessibility and the common ground that you have with a lot of those composers is going to set you up for success to to understand, uh, to to be able to understand what they've written. The disconnect between First Nations cultures and the image immigrant cultures, that is everyone that's come here since 1788. Uh, yeah, that's that's a much more perilous and fragile place. So that's why the homework needs to be done. Ooh. You're librarians, you love homework. That is my perceived notion of who you are as a collective group. There are thrown a blanket over you. <laughs> I would there's a really interesting question here from Kelly. I'll just read it out. Um, I think we've got time for this one. As performers and supporters of performers, because many of us as librarians are performing as well, um, as what uh, we do in our day job as well, how do you recommend we approach the performance of music with First Nations influence, particularly earlier Australian music with respect for cultural heritage? Interesting Don't. question. Don't. Um, there's so much new music being written. Commit yourself to that, first of all, and then we'll figure out, we're still figuring out what we're doing about Skullthorpe and others. You know, Moya Henderson and I had some really interesting conversations um, last year. I curated a new work of hers on Ruth Bader Ginsburg, actually, for the Canberra Symphony Orchestra series this year. And um, Moya and I had, you know, we had... Uh, reason to have conversation about you know the the inclusion of works 
Um, you know why you shouldn't? Because that music that was borrowed or stolen in some cases, music that was just um, uh, appropriated, it's not attached to a person. You know, like there's something really simple about the relationship with First Nations people. Have you ever sat down for a meal with a First Nations person? You had a First Nations person in your home. Have you cooked something for them? Have you allowed them to cook something for you? Have you sat down with them? You know, there's a point at which, um, you know, the acquisition of our knowledges for, for personal gain is just, you have to call it for what it is. All right, well, these are historical examples. Um, and people will want to hear Sculthorpe's works. They will. But while they're hearing Sculthorpe, and that's making up the, you know, the percentage of Australian content you need for that year, then somebody else's voice isn't heard. So for a while, why don't you just leave it alone and, and look at the amazing new works that are being written and from non-Indigenous composers, the amazing works that are being written in collaboration, in true collaboration, and, and, um, and search for those things and champion, and champion them so that th that becomes the standard by which we... Uh, by which we perform. That, that's that's what I would say. Life will go on without Skullthorpe being played um, for a time. I'm not saying it should never, please don't get me wrong, but we're still coming to an understanding of, you know, an understanding of, of what that might have meant to him in his life and his own heritage. And it's it is still very confusing. But if it muscles out, the First Nations voices that are emerging, um, then that would be a great pity, I think. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you, Deborah. That's that, that's actually a really interesting point, isn't it? Because we're moving into another paper from Philippa shortly, a colleague from New Zealand, where a lot of the, um, the um, uh, New Zealand music have, have kind of looked at this for a long time in a way as well. So it'll be interesting to see that comparison for Australia. But um, look, we've covered so much in this hour. So thank you very much. It's been an absolutely amazing time to spend with you in this virtual space. Um, thank you everybody for your questions. And thank you, Deborah, for your incredible insight and wisdom. I think everyone's gonna go away from this today and just go, what a special, time this has been it's it's hard to know isn't it when you're just all in our other spaces everywhere else in the world but here we are and we've been able to listen to you um share your wisdom your knowledge and an incredible insight um and help us to move into a future where we can um gain more knowledge um and work with our indigenous colleagues um, to make our libraries better places to be, whether they're in space or in a digital way, to be able to support you. Uh, can I ask a question before I go? Are there any First Nations um, librarians here today? Could you just put a raise a hand? Yes. Fantastic. Hey, Megan. Megan, Megan yes. are, are you the sole representative here today? I can't see anyone else. Can anyone else see anyone else? Megan, what's your country? What's your la language group? What's your country? I'm a Wabakal. Beautiful. Natne, Galnya. Thank you so much. It's beautiful to have you here. I would say, like, um, nothing about us without us. Right? I would say, just if I'm taking a survey of today, you need for more First Nations librarians. We know that. We definitely know that. <laughs> <laughs> And we, we are, um, I'm not sure about other colleagues, we can talk about it later, Deborah, but we are, we actually want that. Um, and we're working hard to, to try that um, and to, to share um, Indigenous knowledge um, uh, and, and to be able to yeah. look at that, how we will integrate that and support that within our library spaces. It's challenging, very, very challenging. Um, yeah. But there's movement yeah, well, out around the you're world. On, you're on the crest of a wave here. Uh, of of uh, gen a generation, a full generation of First Nations children who are graduating high school and going into their university courses, okay? So you need to court them, court them. Um, you know, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna finish with this note. Uh, I, I began my music education very late in life. I was already 14 before I began music education formally, although it's written in my DNA. But I learned what I learned first 
from the school librarian at my high school who who sat me down and realized that everything I was playing, I was playing by ear. And she said, you need to also be able to read. So stop faking it. And she sat me down. She taught me one lunchtime. And I just say, you know, special places, special memories for me. And um, I wish you all the best in your conference. And thank you for giving me all this time today. It's been a real honor and a pleasure. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, Matthew Stackings has just said, come and join us. We, we need you as a librarian. <laughs> I think I need to be a librarian. I yeah. think I, it, it seems like the kind of life that is calling to me. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> well, come and join us anytime. Um, there's okay. lots and lots of thanks in the, um, the chat um, from everybody, Deborah. Um, it's been a very special time. So thank you very much. Please, everybody, join me with a hand clap um, uh, to Deborah. It's been wonderful thanks so much deborah and we all go online tonight um on the drum starts at six o'clock yeah i guess so we pre-record <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much bye-bye